Before I pray, let me uh, open the word to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. I'd like to read verses 25 to 33. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Now let's pray. Lord, we pray that we would uh, hear your word and by the grace of your spirit within us, uh, respond to it as we ought, as a word of demand, but also a word of invitation. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. Since the U.S. government uh, moved to an all-volunteer army in the post-Vietnam uh, years of the 1970s, I've been interested in following the way that the Army recruits uh, potential candidates. I remember back in the 80s, the slogan was, uh, be all that you can be, join the US Army. It's a great place to start, remember that? Uh, the Army was where you could go to get technical training that would prepare you for the job market and through the GI Bill, you could earn money for college, such a deal. I mean, it was uh, just sign right here on the dotted line, do yourself a favor. You've got a lot to gain. Fulfill your potential. Be all that you can be. Now, those were uh, relatively peaceful days, and uh, being in the Army was almost like enrolling in a technical college for four years with some physical training and some discipline thrown in. But then I remember in 1991, we had the first Gulf War, and suddenly all these Army recruits were saying, you want me to go where? Saudi Arabia? I mean, where in the world is Qatar? Uh, you mean I have to leave my family and fight a war? Now, wait a minute, that's not what I had in mind. That, uh, excuse me, that's not in my contract. Sorry, soldier. You didn't read the small print. It's right here. You go where we want you to go. Now, I've noticed that the ads are much different. Uh, I find it interesting that it seemed to be addressed more to the parents than to the sons and daughters. You see, if you're in a time of prolonged war, uh, with, in a, a deadly combat zone, it's the parents who are the most hesitant about army service. And one ad basically says, when your child talks about enlisting, listen before you just say no. Another has a, a form of flattery. You made them strong, we'll make them army strong. Things have changed. And as you look at the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels, you see that Jesus was attracting a large army of people who surrounded him wherever he went. And they thought that his uh, journey to Jerusalem was a victory march for the crowning of the Messiah. They, they wanted to be there when he claimed his throne to bask in his reflected glory, to grab a share of that prize for themselves. But you see, Jesus didn't want any misunderstanding. There was to be no neglected small print. He wanted to make it quite clear what was required of anyone who would be his disciple and enter the kingdom of God. Again, just listen to what he says. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. If anyone does not carry his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. And again, in verse 33, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. And Jesus says here, this is what it means to be his follower, to be a member of Jesus' army. And no one should enlist without a full understanding of what it means. You should count the cost, he says. 
just as you would before starting any other major endeavor. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, and Jesus here may be referring to a, a kind of a, a silo used on a farm. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? Or if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. Think about the cost first, Jesus says. Make sure you know exactly what you're getting into. Uh, Jesus never engages in uh, what we call bait and switch advertising, you know, that kind of thing where you, you promote some discounted product to get the customers into the door and then you, you get them to buy something much more expensive once they, they come into the store. No, from the beginning, Jesus is entirely upfront and honest. This is an all or nothing proposition. You must follow me completely or not at all. You must hate your father and mother, your wife and children. Now, these are harsh words, especially when we give so much attention to the value of uh, marriage and family relationships, isn't it? Now, we may blunt the sharpness of Jesus' words a bit when, when he talks about hating one's father and mother and wife and children. We point out that the Semitic mind moved in uh, uh, contrasts and extremes, light and darkness, truth and falsehood, love and hate, they thought in terms of primary colors, nothing, uh, no shades of gray in between. But you know, in fact, that Jesus himself loved his own mother and making sure that she was cared for even as he was dying on a cross. But at the same time, Jesus didn't let his mother's desires for him keep him from fulfilling the will of his heavenly Father. Surely, we're not to hate our parents Jesus is just talking about loving him more, we say. And that's true. And of course, Jesus wasn't uh, literally saying that every one of his followers must be crucified just as he was, or that every one of them must actually give away all his possessions. The first Christians never understood him in precisely that way. But there is no doubt Jesus is saying that he must take first place among all our relational loyalties. Any one of you who is not fully devoted to me, he says, anyone who does not give up his claim of ownership on everything he has, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Now, immediately you have to ask yourself, what sort of person can make this kind of demand? I mean, it, 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 what would you think of me if I said something like that? You, you must be more loyal to me than your own mother or father or wife or children. You'd think I was crazy, the leader of some crazy cult. At least you should. You read these words and you realize, first of all, that Jesus can't be a, a mere religious wise man, a, a, a religious teacher sharing a few pearls of wisdom about how to best to get along in the world. He does far more than pass on the golden rule to love your neighbor as yourself. Not even a holy prophet could say the kinds of things that Jesus says here. A prophet says, follow the ways of God. Jesus says, follow me. And if we would be his disciples, Jesus demands our ultimate and absolute devotion, the kind of devotion that rightly belongs to God alone. You see that. You see, if Jesus is not divine, we must say that he was uh, demented, if not downright demonic, in making these kinds of demands, something along the lines of a, a, a Jim Jones cult leader. Now, these can't be the words of a mere uh, teacher of general moral truths who points others to the law of God. These are the words of one who saw himself as the very embodiment of the law. For he called people to follow him as they would follow God alone. For those who are spiritually hungry, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Now, for those who have spiritual thirst, Jesus says, I am the living water. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and be satisfied. Now, for those groping for guidance in life, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
For those under stress and anxieties has come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Those who feel they can do nothing of ultimate value, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me will bear much fruit. For those who wonder what happens after death, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never die. For those looking for spiritual direction and spiritual reality, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. Before Abraham was, I am. I am. I am, he says. As one scholar put it, his most startling revelation was himself. Now, Jesus is like no other religious teacher in the world. John Stott uh, presents the contrast. They are self-effacing. He is self-advancing. They point away from themselves and say, that is the truth so far as I perceive it. Follow that. Jesus says, I am the truth. Follow me. The founder of none of the ethnic religions has dared to say such a thing. Do you want to be a Christian? Do you want to be a, a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ? And these are all different ways of saying the same thing. If you want to be a Christian, then listen again to these words. Anyone who comes after me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. If anyone does not carry his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Now, these are hard words. Now, many people see these demands as entirely unreasonable, impossible, unthinkable. But I want to try to put it in, in another light just for a, a minute here. You see, I'm a pastor, and as a pastor, I perform weddings. And as one who officiates at weddings, I'm struck by the fact that these requirements of Jesus sound strangely similar to what's expected in a marriage. I mean, isn't the commitment required in a marriage just as exclusive? Isn't it just as unconditional? Isn't it just as demanding of what, as what Jesus has set before us? I, I say to the groom, will you have this woman to be your wedded wife? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, and forsaking all others, keep you only unto her, so long as you both shall live? And of course, I ask the same thing of the bride. And each of them will say to one another, with this ring I thee wed, and with all my worldly goods I thee endow. And doesn't Paul instruct husbands to love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her? He gave himself up for her by his death. Isn't all of this included in the words, will you marry me? Will you make me the preeminent person in your life? Will you set aside your parents, your brothers, your sisters, all your other friends, and devote yourself first and foremost to me? Will you give up sole ownership of all that you have and share all that you own with me as I make this same commitment to you? Those are incredible requests, but that's what marriage entails, isn't it? No other lovers on the side. No secret bank accounts, no higher loyalties, none. That's what marriage means. At least it ought to. And certainly one of the uh, purposes of premarital counseling is to spell out what this commitment of marriage looks like. Isn't it? I, I want couples to read the small print so that they can uh, go beyond the romantic thrill associated with uh, getting married and face up to the challenge, the commitment, the devotion that marriage requires. Those who are getting married must first count the cost. I don't want any husband or wife I marry to be able to say at some later point when the harsh winds of uh, trials and hardship begin to blow, that's not in my contract. It is in your contract. Marriage demands everything of you. That's what you sign up for, nothing less. The funny thing, though, even when they understand the unconditional contract of marriage, people still want to get married. Uh, people get married all the time. In fact, they delight to get married. Now, why is that? It's because there is something so attractive about their husband or wife-to-be that they're drawn 
almost irresistibly, to give themselves to that other person in love. They long to enter into this exclusive, intimate, loving relationship which marriage represents. They long for the joy which marriage can bring. They long to entrust themselves to this other person. They believe that their marriage partner can be trusted with their very lives, and so they do it. And people who are getting married, they, they don't think of what they're giving up. They think of what they're gaining. See, people, people who are getting married don't think of it as some great uh, sacrifice to be made, some heavy burden to be borne, some solemn duty to be performed for some greater good. No, not at all. Marriage is a joy. It is a delight. It is a cause for great rejoicing. They want everybody to know about it. It is a big public event, something worth celebrating. They, they throw a great big party. And you see... Becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, being his disciple, becoming a Christian, it, it must be like that too. You see, a Christian is someone who wants to gain Christ. You, you see something of his character, his truth, his trustworthiness, his overwhelming love, his beauty, and then you desire him like a, like a precious pearl that is worth everything to own. It is with joy that you go and you sell all that you have so that you may gain that precious pearl. And the, the Apostle Paul experienced that. He, he had an impressive resume. He had much to be proud of. And yet he writes, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He says, whatever, uh, what is more, I consider everything to be lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ. He says, nothing, nothing that this world has to offer can compare to it. This surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. And Peter expresses the same thing. He writes to the Christian believers of their experience of Christ. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him, now you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. It, it, it's a surpassing greatness. It's an inexpressible and glorious joy. This is what is offered to the follower of Jesus Christ, to gain Christ. It's to know a satisfaction, a delight, a deep contentment that this world knows nothing of. And it is a present reality with the promise of, of an eternal reward. And that's the pearl that can be yours. You too can be my disciple, Jesus says. Every one of you can afford it. All it costs is all that you have. But without that, you cannot be my disciple. Do you mean everything, Lord? Yes, everything. But does that mean mother and father, wife and children, Lord? Yes, even they must be entrusted to my care while you follow me. Will you trust me? He asked each one of us. Will you trust me? Uh, John White, who was associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Manitoba and author of a number of very helpful Christian books, speaks of his own struggle with this demand of discipleship and an extraordinary story from uh, his book, The Cost of Commitment. He writes, uh, once I had a premonition that my wife and infant son would be killed in a flying accident. We were to travel separately from the U.S. to Bolivia. The premonition came with sickening certainty just before we parted on the night of a wild snowstorm. I felt I was a cowardly fool as I drove away and saw Lori silhouetted in the yellow light of the doorway surrounded by swirling snowflakes. Why didn't I go back and tell her I would cancel the flight? Why didn't I act on this foreboding? Yet I felt a fool. I didn't believe in premonitions, and she would probably laugh. Besides, I was late. I had to get to the place where I would spend the night before my early morning flight. Fear, shame, guilt, nausea all boiled up inside me during the miserable drive to my hotel. No conversation was possible with the man who was driving me. In bed, I tossed in misery. Of course, I prayed. By faith, I was going to have it licked. Faith? In the presence of so powerful a premonition, my mouth was dry, my limbs shook. God was a million miles away. The hours crawled by, each one a year of fear. Why didn't I get dressed, hire a car, and go back to them? 
What's the matter? Can't you trust me? I was startled. Was God speaking? Yes, I'll trust you if you promise to give them back to me. Silence. Then, and if I don't promise, if I don't give them back to you, will you stop trusting me? Oh, God, what are you saying? My, my heart had stopped. I couldn't breathe. Can you not entrust them to me in death as well as in life? Suddenly, a physical warmth flowed through all my body. I think I wept a little. My words came tremblingly and weakly. Yes, I place them in your hands. I know you will take care of them in life or in death. And my trembling subsided. Peace, better by far than martinis on an empty stomach. Peace flowed over and over me, and drowsily I drifted off to sleep. Hate them? How could I ever hate them? Yet, by faith I had said, in effect, I will do your will, whatever it costs, to me or them. And I trust you. Their plane crashed. Everyone on board was killed. But my wife had also had a premonition and cut their journey short, getting off the plane to stop before the tragedy occurred. I'm grateful for the way it worked out, but I didn't know beforehand that things would go as they did. And had it not worked out that way, I would have grieved. God knows how I would have grieved. But I would not have regretted my decision to trust and go forward. This is what it means to follow Christ fully. To follow Christ fully, to trust him. If anyone comes after me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. It's like a marriage, isn't it? But as we think of marriage, there is a disturbing trend in our culture. We all know about it these days. Instead of getting married, many couples today are simply living together. Uh, the statistics are astounding. Uh, the, the number of unmarried couple households recorded by the Census Bureau multiplied almost 10 times in the last 40 years. Almost two-thirds of the people born between 1963 and 1974 first cohabited without marrying. Now, I have to say, uh, cohabiting seems like a very sensible thing to do. Uh, I can understand why it's so attractive. I mean, no one buys a car without first going for a test drive. I mean, shouldn't we try out living together first before making some big binding commitment? And why do we even need to make that kind of commitment anyway? I mean, we love each other. That's all that counts. And if we no longer love each other, then why should we have to stay together? I mean, if someone else comes along who attracts me, why should I have to be locked in to just one partner? For life, that seems absurd. You see, cohabiting allows me to keep my options open. Isn't that what it means to be free? A cohabitation before or instead of marriage has now become normal. Yet no matter how normal it becomes, such cohabitation, I want you to see, is a form of deception. It seems to me that the biggest problem here is a confusion of categories. Uh, cohabitation looks a lot like marriage. You have a man and a woman living together in the same house, sharing the same bed. But in fact, it differs from marriage in the one essential thing that makes a marriage a marriage. Is he, cohabiting couples, I'm sure, have, uh, have a certain kind of romantic love. There's no question about that. But it, it's a love that lacks the one essential element that comes with marital love. It lacks commitment. You see, it lacks that pledge, that public pledge of exclusive, unconditional, lifelong, loyal love. Uh, the, the kind of pledge that makes the nature of that relationship very clear to everyone who's affected by it. You see, that's why cohabiting before marriage isn't a trial marriage at all. It's nothing like a marriage, for it lacks the one thing that makes a marriage a marriage. 
And the testimony of both the Bible and of human history is that the kind of relationship between a man and a woman to be had in cohabitation is contrary to how we were created to live. We were so made that our lives as men and women together most flourish and the society in which we live most flourishes when men and women live in exclusive, committed, lifelong relationships of loyal love recognized publicly through the covenant of marriage. Now that's true for all sorts of reasons, not least because that's the environment in which children are best brought into the world and nurtured into adulthood. And people who cohabit are deceived into thinking that they are experiencing marriage when they're not. It's an imitation. It's a poor reflection. It's a shadow of the real thing. They don't know what it is to give of themselves fully and to live with someone who is committed to them with all their heart and soul, unconditionally, exclusively, with a love that only death can destroy. Now let's get back to these uh, harsh words of Jesus we've been considering here. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Now I want you to notice the word cannot in that phrase. Jesus doesn't say that if you don't love him above all else, that he won't allow you to be his disciple. As if it were a matter of him giving you permission. No, he says that if you don't love him above all else, you cannot be his disciple. The word there is dunatai, which suggests not permission, but possibility. In other words, it's not possible to be Jesus' disciple without these conditions. A failure to commit yourself to him exclusively and unconditionally is incompatible with what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Do you see that? Now imagine someone coming to the wedding altar and saying that, yes, I, I want to get married to you so long as I can continue to sleep around with other women and I can give you 10% of my income. I'm free to come and go in this marriage whenever I like. No, no, no. You don't get it. You don't understand. That's not marriage. That's something else entirely. That's not what marriage means. You see, Jesus is saying the same thing. He's saying, this is what it means to be a disciple of me. It means an exclusive, unconditional, loyal love that is supreme in your life. To have a relationship with God himself through Jesus Christ is like a marriage. It requires this kind of commitment in a sense by definition. Without it, there can be no relationship at all. You can have a half-hearted sort of semi-committed relationship with a pagan God perhaps, but not with Yahweh the Lord, the God of the Bible, not with the God who created the heavens and the earth, not with the, the God who's revealed himself in Jesus Christ. It's just not possible. He is a jealous God. He will tolerate no rivals. You shall have no other gods before him. There is simply no other way to relate to this God. And you see what this means? It means, you see, that there are a lot of people who are deceived. They think they can gauge in a kind of spiritual cohabitation. Having a kind of spiritual relationship with God without any sort of public and exclusive commitment. They can have a relationship with God in Jesus Christ on their own private terms, when they want it, however it suits them, without that unconditional and exclusive commitment to Christ. Now superficially what they experience looks like real Christianity, but in fact is something fundamentally different. It lacks the core of what it of what makes a person a follower of Christ. You see, Jesus demands that we give him our lives. It's that simple. Again, is he asking too much? I mean, we do that in a horizontal, uh, humanly level for, for a husband or a wife. Why not for the God of the universe? Now, again, I think of this as uh, in the context of the church. This, isn't this what believer's baptism is about? It's like a wedding, isn't it? Believer's baptism is that public act by which a person says, I want to be joined to Christ forever. I'm willing to die with Christ, to go down in the grave with him so that I might be raised up with him. In faith, I give him all that I am. 
that I may gain all that he is. And in baptism, we see visibly displayed God's pledge of commitment to us in the gospel as we're joined to Christ in this visible, tangible way. Now, I've heard of people refusing to be baptized simply because they don't want to be seen with their hair wet. Can such a person really be a disciple of Jesus? I mean, would you think of a, what would you think of a, a, a bride or groom too embarrassed to get up in front of a church to say their wedding vows? They don't understand what marriage is about, you see. They don't get it. And many who were a part of that crowd of people who gathered around Jesus, they didn't understand that when Jesus calls a man, to use the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he bids him come and die. Jesus doesn't want to just sort of put some makeup on our lives. He wants to change us from the inside out. He wants to make us new creatures. He wants us to restore us into the, the very image of God which we're created to be. We must die so that we may be raised up into new life. You know, many people want a casual relationship, but it simply can't work that way. And what is so sad about that kind of deception is that many people try this kind of cohabiting Christianity and they find it so dull, so boring, entirely unfulfilling that they give the whole thing up altogether. Or they just continue through the motions, engaging in religious activities with no expectations, no satisfactions, no joy. And it's the same way with many people who respond to cohabiting relationships. They have that same experience and so they reject marriage when in fact they've never tried it. And just as God created us to prosper as men and women together in the relationship of marriage, which is by definition exclusive and unconditional, so God has created us to prosper as human beings in this relationship with himself, which is by definition exclusive and unconditional. Anything less is a poor imitation of the real thing. If anyone does, comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Anyone does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Any of you does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Now, as I said, people get married because they delight in it. And you may be asking, well, what if I don't feel it? What if I don't see the kingdom that Jesus came to bring as that precious pearl that is worth everything to obtain? And you may say, I, I, I know nothing of the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus that Paul talks about. I've never experienced anything of the inexpressible and glorious joy that Peter speaks of. Why would I want to give myself unconditionally to this Jesus? Well, the first thing I would say that if you do not see Jesus Christ as the most glorious and desirable object of your desire, then something is wrong with you. For that is what he is. And you must begin by confessing that to God and asking him to set it right. You must ask him to set it right, to give you the capacity to function properly as a human being. We must ask him because such joy in knowing Christ is itself a gift from God. It is God himself who, who opens our eyes to see the beauty of his kindness and his holiness and his goodness and his grace. It is, it is he himself who allows us to taste the sweetness of his goodness. As fallen creatures captivated by sin, you see, by nature, we flee from it. By nature, we suppress it, we turn away from it, we're blind to it. It's, it's like many people who see marriage as a form of captivity. It takes away their freedom. That's the way we are with God. And that's why we can only see Jesus Christ in all his glory. If we're born again by the Spirit, if the Spirit's work to open our eyes, to, to see the beauty of Christ, so that our hearts may respond to him as we ought. If Jesus Christ is not precious to you, then you need to plead with God to heal you of your blindness. You need to ask God to forgive you and, and ask him to give you a spirit so that you can see. Now, you may need to recognize that you've never really come to the altar at all. You've never really made a commitment to Christ in the first place. You need to turn to him in faith and ask him 
to be your Savior and your Lord. And there may be people even here in the Fellows Program who have not yet made that commitment. You need to do that. But you may say, I've done that. I, I know I've been born again. I've tasted the Lord's goodness. I know it's sweet. I've seen glimpses of God's glory, but, but I still find that my heart is cold toward him. There's no attraction, no delight, no joy in knowing him. Well, I've appreciated John Piper's work on this subject in his little book, When I Don't Desire God. Again, you, you first need to confess that to the Lord. Because it's only the disordered nature of our own desires that diminishes the joy that we ought to have in knowing God. And then you need to ask Him to change you. Only God can enable us to see His beauty. This joy is God's gifts. But you know, there are some things that we can do to set our hearts right. So that we might delight in what is our rightful duty. And, and that's really what the Fellows Program is about. Helping you to see the glory of Christ. Helping you to see that there's nothing more worthy of your, your desires and your aspirations in life but to serve this great God who's revealed himself so wonderfully and graciously in Jesus Christ. And so think of all that you do in the Fellows Program as simply trying to help you to see that, that Jesus Christ is a precious pearl worth giving everything to obtain. And so I think you need to do the kinds of things you might need to do to rejuvenate a stale marriage. You need to spend time with him in worship, bowing before him as the great God who created heaven and earth. You need to communicate with him, hearing his voice in the scripture, responding to him in prayer. You need to show him your love in acts of love and obedience, generously re responding to the needs of those you see around you. You need to appreciate just what a glorious Savior he is as you continually come back to the cross, that wondrous, glorious cross on which he bore our sins, even the sin of our failure to love him as we ought. And once we see Christ for who he is, once we taste the sweetness of his love and grace, you see, we'll not see the words that we've been looking at here today as some onerous demand upon us. Instead, we'll see them as, as our natural response to the beauty and the sweetness of his love. And, and what, a, what a joy we will find in offering him more and more of ourselves. Our deepest desire will be to grow in our knowledge of Christ. This is what it means to be a follower, disciple of Jesus Christ. There can be no other way. By the way, I saw a new military ad on television not long ago. It's from the Marines. It said, we don't accept applications, only commitments. I think Jesus would agree. Are you willing to sign on, to say yes to the commitment required to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? It requires your all. And he desires to give you his all. And there can be no greater joy than that. And let's pray. I think of the words of Augustine. How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. You drove them from me. You who are the true, the sovereign joy. You drove them from me and took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure though not to flesh and blood. You who outshine all light, yet are hidden deeper than any secret in our hearts. You who surpass all honor, though not in the eyes of men who see all honor in themselves. O oh Lord my God, my light, my wealth, my salvation, and my joy. O oh Lord, help us to see your beauty and desire you more than anything else. Lord, may we become your disciple, offering ourselves to you in that exclusive, unconditional, lifelong commitment of love. In Jesus' name we pray.